Welcome to Head Change, the podcast that puts you in a better headspace. I'm your host, Levi Strom. Transcripts of today's episode are brought to you thanks to a generous donation by Aram Stoney at Big Sur Cannon Botanicals. Thank you, Aram. On today's episode, I interview Ron Spencer of Biosync Industries on regenerative hemp farming. Uh, you're, you're the expert. I want to hear from you, Ron. And, and if you want to just tell me your story and, and how you got involved in hemp, and then we can kind of break it down from there. Well, one of the first rules, too, is if you're in this game, you consider yourself an expert. You're definitely not an expert because right. <laughs> there is something new to learn every single year. But you're right about the unique side of Oregon. And, and one of the ways I try to describe that, too, is because we're in a, a very special uh, microclimate um, that if we were the wine industry, I would compare it to like Southern France. Mm-hmm. You have like these very unique wines like in the world. And that's the same thing we've got between our mountain ranges, the way the soils develop, you know, the trees and all that kind of stuff. That whole system is cultivated this kind of magic uh, spot that this plant just loves. Uh, but I mean, even though like it can grow pretty much anywhere, like you said, I mean, that's how you know, it's, it's cousin got the word weed because, you know, it could just grow right there in the ditch, you know, and we've had a couple of strains that we've just kind of planted in various different spots and not watered. And it's like, it can just, it can rock, it can do its thing. So, um, but my background, so my, uh, uh, I kind of started this back in college. Uh, I was studying architecture at the university of Oregon and we were really focused on it's a good architecture and, school. Go it ducks. was, Yep. Beautiful. Heck yeah, man. Class of uh, 2003 right here. Sociology. Yeah. So that's how oh, I got, that's how I got yeah, into smoking dude. weed. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. It's funny. I didn't even start smoking until after college, except for like, you know, that occasional 420 day where it's like you and your buddies just, you know, got all the munchies and all the stuff and had a grand old time. <laughs> Might have missed class that day, but. <laughs> for sure. I had a few of those. <laughs> so uh, I was studying uh, under my professor at the time was Brooke Muller, and uh, we were really focused on blending uh, ecology with the built world. So uh, the concept of a living building. Um, so it's like you have all of these elements of a building that are contributing to the space, but they're static. You know, you got concrete walls. You got this, that. How can you incorporate that more as a natural system? And so uh, uh, I dove into the concept of system thinking from there and became uh, fascinated by uh, dualities uh, and synchronistic uh, relationships. So it's like, if you can scratch my back, I can scratch yours. And nature over time has really perfected those, those things. And that is kind of it's not kind of it's the future of where we're going to have to take agriculture in general um it just uh as the card shook out hemp uh turned out to be that perfect plant to trigger for myself so after architecture school uh i was lucky enough to graduate into the great recession there where uh architecture work didn't really exist anymore (laughs) when the construction industry crashes you know architects are the first to go but that was a blessing in disguise because uh, i ended up i wasn't really meant to be in an office that wasn't my vibe um and so i came back to the family ranch and decided i just want to get my hands dirty and went into cattle ranching with my dad because at the same time cattle have a stigma about them as being very not good for the environment and in certain situations that's true but that's the same with any industry as soon as you scale monocle like a mono style if if you're doing too much of one thing in one space you know it's going to have a negative impact over time um so i went back to the mission to be like all right well how can i do some tweaks and turns on the cattle stuff and and start like you know figuring out how to do some stuff for long term and at the same time i got into cannabis because i have a very active mind and so like I can be running around like dee, 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 you know, in my brain and never wanted to do uh, all the like the ADD things and all that stuff because I just I didn't like the potential of some of those things. I'm not smart enough to say what it does and what it doesn't, but like I just it freaked me out. So um, that's how I got into weed. And so that was kind of like my evening calm down. It's like, all right, you can turn off, de-stress, do all this, sleep better, all those good things. So. Uh, and at that time is when I started to see that it was going to be just a matter of time until 
those plots were going from you know your 48 plant grows to acres right so i started doing experiments in my backyard uh with ommp um trying to find out how to automate the process and turn it into that scale but with the intention of doing some of these regenerative agriculture concepts underneath it and then uh once i basically saw the green light to jump in uh i pounced um so uh that's really the story of how i got started the the, the name biosync is really designed as a concept of syncing up all these biologies into different systems so they're working completely together and uh together they're creating more than you're putting in because uh traditional or this century's you know industrial faculty has been um uh, the line right you put in inputs you get an output and you have waste that's just the process right it's been the same with agriculture you put in something you pull out something you have waste well we're always talking about closing the loop so that waste needs to be able to go back into that same system so you're not depleting the system because as long as you're taking out more than you put in it's going to deplete over time but you know that that is easily reversible where you can do that same modifying that system and you know mapping it off of natural things that are already existent you can be creating more in that system than you're actually taking out just because of the life that's going on underneath the soil um so it's like if you want to get into regenerative farming tactics like that becomes your building block of everything it's just the relationship with the soil um and, and that's like <clears throat> i just want to pause you there for a quick second because yeah, there's yeah. There's so much cool I'll shit. Spitball. I'll spitball. You're gonna have to like. No, you're you're saying so much cool stuff, and I love that. Like, it comes from the University of Oregon architecture program. So I know how progressive the U of O is, and yeah, and, like my sister went to U of O too, and you know she studied. I can't remember what she studied, and but like it was the farming class at the U of O that like really I think like impacted her more than anything else. It was like the gardening yeah. class, you know, and right. But that whole approach, you know, because it's such a different mindset, right? I mean, you can have the approach of, Hey, I'm going to start a cannabis or a hemp farm and I'm going to put in X amount of money. I'm going to get out X amount of money and the environmental cost is never factored in. And, you know, it's that type of thinking that's gotten us into the problem that we're in right now with climate change. And, um, just taking that different fundamental approach of, you know, we want to actually, restore and revive and help this environment thrive because obviously nature is really good at sustaining life it's like mm -hmm. the expert at it we're, we're kind of like the new kids on the block we haven't really figured out how to live in harmony on the planet yet yeah but if you look to nature and its systems it it has all the answers it tells us exactly yeah. what to do we just have to be smart enough to listen to it you know correct yeah it's like it'll win every time like i like to say like you know every season's a battle and so you have a choice. Do you want to fight against nature or with nature? And she's she's gonna drop kick everything. It's like being, <laughs> it's like surfing. You know, I'm a surfer, and you know, really the battle with surfing is the the ocean has such a tremendous amount of energy. Yeah. And if you fight it, you're never yeah. gonna win ever. No. One hundred percent of the time, you're gonna lose that fight. But if you kind of just give up and like start to be smart, you know, use the eddies and the tides and like yeah and conserve your energy and work with like get you know breathe with the ocean and really like kind of get in tune with it yeah and all of a sudden you don't even feel like you're doing anything and you're just like flying down waves and just like a you're like a dolphin all of a sudden yeah it's funny you say that too because like the 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 cat cataclysmic moment where i actually finally dove in and started this was based on like a surfing trip i went on like i'm not a surfer i just like you know, taking a week vacation at a surf hostel and just, you know, messing around and just being a dork in the waves for a while. Uh, but like why I always choose that environment is you meet some of the most uniquely intelligent humans when it comes to exactly that. Like they can look at that ocean and tell you everything about like that two miles they see where a common person would be like, hey, look, there's a wave. Maybe we'll see a dolphin. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so it was just like it gave me such a fun perspective of like, how to look yeah if you ever bit. want to know what the weather report is like talk to a surfer they'll right they'll give you like <laughs> the most accurate weather report ever <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. man i just exactly. ate, I just so, ate some of that flour it, it tastes good 
Hell yeah, dude. Hell yeah, dude. Like, people need to eat eat it raw more often because I mean, the, the, there's some good nutrients in that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's I, that's what I think. I'm all about the raw and like, um, you know, making tinctures from the actual plant. You know, make not, a sweet salad dressing, dude. <laughs> make a sweet salad dressing. Yeah, a lot of people use the tinctures I make for culinary purposes. And heck yeah, dude. Couple. I started cooking with Keef. That's nice. fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dude, because some of those things, like like specifically, like sweet uh, the maraschino, it's uh it's really good, like on like a barbecue type thing. If like you smoke some meats and stuff, and just dribble some of that across the top. Yum. I'm telling yeah. you, man. If if there if there's a culinary person listening, do it, dude. Vibe with that. It's so a little a little dry <laughs> rub with raw yeah, cannabis. Yeah, mm-hmm. smoke that thing with some oak or something. Yep. That sounds amazing. Yeah, I might yeah. I might have to try that. <laughs> yeah, so there's that. <laughs> so, so you started so you, you studied architecture, you got into kind of environmental architecture to put it simply, you know, and kind of, you know, thinking beyond just traditional, you know, buildings like how does this building actually fit into the environment that it's in and how can we mm-hmm. make how can we make this a living structure? Mm-hmm. So kind of applying that knowledge over to your farm and what you've done with biosync is kind of the same mentality. So, so you, you went to school, you learned this stuff, you probably, you started smoking a little weed. Maybe your dad <laughs> wasn't as hip to it back then. I'm guessing if you're like, like me, you know, and you kind of got into the industry, it was kind of like, what are you doing? I'd be like, well, I'm going to work on a farm. And they'd be like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly building fences and milking goats on this farm, but uh-huh. it's a farm and I'm doing, I'm doing work, but how did you like, was there a struggle to convince your dad to like, Hey dad, let's start growing hemp. Like, what was that conversation? Like, I'm just curious. Uh, yes and no. So like, it was a struggle for sure. Uh, just from, uh, I'm actually really lucky that my, my dad has been super supportive and, uh, really good advice too. in the concept of like taking this stuff and scaling it, you know, cause like going from like a, 48 plant grow to, you know, 2000 per acre. Um, and like the first year I did 80 acres. So it's like, it's, there's some learning lessons to go on. Right. And so like, I, I got a really good education from him on that side, but like really with the way my dad thinks it was just like mapping it out and showing us like, Hey, here is the, the market that exists. Here's why it exists. This is what it takes to do all this and just really having a plan in place. Right um that that's really what it took on that front um and then just evolving with the market so right because so, it's so you, one so hell of a roller coaster too <laughs> no doubt and this is what yeah. i want people that are listening to understand is like when we're talking about like family farms like we mm. like this is like this is it this is like fathers and sons this is like families you know mm-hmm. and that gets lost so much you know in the in the corporate world that mm-hmm. you know businesses are run by people you know Mm-hmm. run by family people families come together you know and I get so much support from my family too and there's a lot of brands that I work with and know that it's like they got their they literally have their whole family working for the company you know yeah it's like yeah. the mom's doing the baking for the edibles and the dad's doing the <laughs> sales and you know right and that, that is so cool like that right. that's the American dream you know yeah and I feel like the kind of the hemp industry and the cannabis industry are kind of like the last the last best chance a lot of us have to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps because if you're industrious and hardworking and motivated and Mm -hmm. positive I think you have a there's a future in this space for you Mm -hmm. but it's not easy Um, Mm -mm. the competition is crazy high how you know I know the Oregon cannabis market got flooded after legalization and pot growers grew way too much weed for the state and you can't ship cannabis across state lines which was kind of what a lot of the farmers started switching over to hemp because you can actually ship that across state lines. So did you, did you start, if you're willing to talk about it, did you, did you start with cannabis and then switch over to hemp or have you always been a hemp farmer? Yeah, I was doing OMP uh, in the, in the backyard, just like really yeah. small. And I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't marketing it or anything like that. Just learning the plant, learning, learning the yep. system, yep. because it's like, at that point you had, you know, the fundamentals that were being passed down for lack of a better term, but like the elders, I believe the best way to refer to it. It's like, I kept asking the question is like, why? So like, okay, we're doing all this stuff. We're using this certain kind of soil. We're feeding these certain ingredients. We're doing all this. Why, why, why kind of a thing. And it's like, 
every year you're almost replacing a lot of that same soil with new soil instead of this and everything it's like i started to see you know the breakdown in the chain of like great this is growing wonderful things and, the, and they've they've learned so much from this process but it's like maybe we don't need to do all these different things and maybe we can cultivate that ourselves and um so the it was a giant backyard experience i i try to say it's like if farmers could be a garage band like that was the garage band right yeah. there <laughs> until we went to the acreage part um and, I, and I then think, like yeah and then what like with the acreage part too like i'll relate that back to the architecture concept was um my, my graduate thesis was focused on um especially the time of the financial crisis was that you know buildings are completely dictated almost by rent rolls, right? Everything that you do is based on either your exit value or your rent rolls. Um, then, you know, with solar power and stuff like that, wind power, they, they started to be able to cut costs by adding, you know, power back to the grid or anything like that. But that still wasn't, I mean, I guess it's a revenue stream, but I didn't really consider it a revenue stream because that was just cost cutting because they're still paying more for extra power than they're creating. Um, until like there's one developer up in Portland that I met with a few times that really inspired me, Kevin Cavanaugh, where it's like he was turning the green roofs uh, and one of his buildings into an actual vegetable garden, which then supported the restaurant on top. And it was like, boom, okay, so how do we take like these fundamental areas that are just a wall and turn them into additional revenue? So at that time, I was very intrigued by aquaponics, and I was trying to use that system into an algae-based production thing where you're creating all your own fuel, you're growing food, you're producing fish, all these different things within the building that already was gonna exist in general. So it's like, all right, great, we just turned it into a farm because the long-term thing is, you know, vertical farm is very intriguing to me. Um, yeah. So with that said, like when I came back here on the family farm, like, we're constantly kind of analyzing the operation to see like, hey, how can we maximize this? How can we do this? Because if anybody's involved with farming, you discover really quickly how to turn duct tape and bailing wire into anything you need. So you just like, you got to be dialed in with a sharp pencil. Um, and we've got some bottom ground with some really good soil that isn't exactly unique or it isn't exactly being used the best for cattle grazing, you know? Like we have it and it uses it, it works, but that soil could be doing so much more than just growing a grass crop of cattle. And that had been on our mind for a long time. And that was really where that plan came in place of like, look, we've got this plot of land. It needs to be utilized a little bit stronger. Hey, here's this industry that it would plan to really well. And you could double dip because in the off season, I still use it for cattle as part of this closed loop thing, which I can talk about later. Um, but that that's really where that shift happened, where it's like, we've got this chunk of land it's not performing in there like it should. So let's make it perform better this way. And, and that was really the beginning. Yeah, I definitely want to talk to you about the cattle because I have my conceptions. I know I've like, I know there's like a guy, I can't remember his name that uh, is really preaching like, actually like beef isn't the problem because a lot of environmentalists say, you know, hey, everybody needs to go vegan. It's the only way we're going to save the planet. The menthol or the methane mm -hmm. from cattle is like, you know, the biggest greenhouse gas and all that. And it is, but there's this other, other approach that actually uses the cattle and, and you move them around to graze and it's actually a carbon sink. I don't really understand it. I'd love for you to explain that. So I think the fellow you're referring to is Alan Savory with the yeah. Savory Institute. Yep. Yep. Amazing, amazing work. Like he, he was a big deal in me deciding to come back to the cattle as well. So they, they, they term that mob grazing and mm -hmm. you can relate it a lot to the importance of the Buffalo on the plains in the days of the past interesting it is um so what happens um at that at that point so this is our off season where we're growing a cover crop right so that cover crop grows uh there's lots of different mixtures that you could use and do what you do is you send the cattle through at a high capacity right and they mow off that top portion really quick they're very picky eaters sometimes unless there's nothing left and then they'll just forage around it's like like they know what tastes good. They know what their Twinkies are and they know what their cheeseburgers are. They love it. They're into it. And so they'll, they'll mob graze all that good stuff off. Right. At the same time, all that manure goes right back onto the soil. And then the third thing that happens there is they're actually packing down the rest of the forage over the top. Right. And at that point, that's when you shift them over the next one. So what they've done to that system is one, 
uh, soil is basically just uh, decomposed, you know, organic matter, right? So whenever you're doing soil tests and stuff, you want to know how much organic matter is in your soil, because that's where your beneficial bugs, your worms, all your all your organisms in there are consuming that to turn it into the nutrients, right? You know, so like uh, worm castings is probably one of your best nutrients to put in. So if you have an earthworm colony under your soil that's eating this organic matter, you're naturally producing those castings, right? right. So uh, what they do is that takes time for all that organic matter to be broken down. They speed up the process by digesting it through their system up front, just that fraction amount that they go across the top. So they're throwing that back down as their manure. Within their manure, cattle have a lot of really beneficial bugs in the digestive system. So they're basically throwing lots of uh, microbes and all that good stuff back into the soil as well. So you've got uh, an acceleration of the decomposition of your organic matter and a lot of beneficial bugs. The third thing is, is that they're smashing down the rest of the organic matter, which then acts like a protective barrier on top of it. So if you, if you leave a, a ground of soil bare, and the sun is exposed to it, moisture is gonna evaporate like crazy, right? You know, it's just like if you put a towel in the sun to dry it off, right? Well, with that layer of grass smashed over the top creates like, you know, a thermal barrier where it actually protects all that water in the ground and allows your aquifer to soak it up better like a sponge, right? So you're protecting your moisture inside and, and, and Alan's work has been to reverse desertification with it same thing so it's like you're limited on the amount of moisture that can get in you trample all that stuff down get your moisture back on top it protects it in the soil to create that next level of life right because the more water that's in your soil without being too much promotes all that extra life as well as the organic matter to feed them so hmm. you really got to cultivate a system underneath the soil then you can I, I think one of my favorite things is uh from the realm of like bacteria and beneficial bugs, it's like you can take a handful of soil and there's more organisms in that handful of soil, good soil, um, than there are humans on the earth hmm. and just one handful, right? And so it's like, if you start paying attention to that and cultivate your soil, the stuff that's gonna follow, you know, becomes like, you know, that bud you've got right there, so. Yeah, yeah. You're, re you're, really, you're really like growing soil. You're not really growing yes. plant, plants with a byproduct. 100%. And you know, hemp just was the best option for it, right? So it's it's so actually using, and obviously you have to start with good soil. And I want to talk about the Umpqua Valley where you where you're growing. I think that's a really special region of work. I'm from Oregon, so I know the area really well. And yeah. I know I know what a beautiful, pristine area that is, and the air quality is really good. There's so many trees to filter. The water quality is really great. Uh, lots of good sunshine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Oregon has some of the, the best wine in the world too. Yeah. So naturally yeah. it's going to grow some of the best cannabis, but that closed loop system you're describing is really cool. Cause um, it kind of like, I can really understand it now where you, you have the earthworms underneath that are really mm -hmm. digest speeding up the natural mm -hmm. composting process and, mm -hmm. and quickly processing that organic material into a more usable form and a, and a bacteria rich uh, byproduct, the castings. And then the cattle are obviously providing a lot of the organic material eating the cover crops and cover crops are also beneficial right they're like nitrogen Correct. fixing and all that Correct. So, that's why you pick your mix right yeah and then what about what about like the carbon trapping because isn't that a part of this system yeah too? yeah so that's something i need to do some more math on because it, it's always been on my mind is understanding it but um that's not necessarily from the cattle that's going to go back to the uh the crops that you're growing or whatever because you know they're pulling co2 out of earth so the other element that's going into the soil is you know trapped carbon from the air being added back to the soil right that that's really going for one of our biggest battles that we're going to have to try to figure out it's like i'm kind of excited to see what turns up of uh elon musk's uh new competition of you know the best carbon capture thing mm -hmm. so yeah they're supposed to release it more i think that's i think that's like so, our only chance honestly i hate to say it. i hate to say it i mean i you know, I'm not a climate scientist, but when I read the climate scientists news, it's horribly depressing. I mean, you, it is, know. but it's, you know, it shouldn't be because it's, it's actually exciting. So like, I know this COVID thing has really wrecked havoc across a lot of industries and all that stuff, but I think it's also turning into a giant wake up call because people are much more um, concerned about what they're putting in their bodies, where it came from and how it's created. And there's a lot more climate initiatives kind of coming in because uh, the science there to 
to reverse it and go back to a stasis and even regenerative is is there we we have it we have the ability to do it we just need the economic incentive to do it right right, um, right. because you go back to what you're talking about with common accounting principles like one of the uh analogies i like to use is currently uh, a tree is valued more dead and cut up than alive in the forest and that and that's a flaw right because there's a value in that forest as a carbon sink as an air filtration as a soil like uh, anti-erosion like there's so many different variables in that one element that we're not currently evaluating that eventually we need to get to a point where we are um and so that's where it comes back like i i would really love to dive more into that but i'm definitely not not versed in it well but you know if this carbon credit trading and stuff like that picks up that'll that'll incentivize right. us a more aggressive approach this is where yeah in the elon musk competition and this is where we need our best and brightest minds focused on this issue mm -hmm. and like i always like joke with my girlfriend it's like our best and brightest minds right now are, are going towards developing new instagram filters exactly right? and putting like bunny ears on people which takes a ton of hours you know i mean i can't even imagine the amount of brain power it takes to figure out how to put bunny ears on people when they look into their smartphone imagine mm -hmm. if we had all that brain power going towards solving, you know, climate yeah. change in a go, way go that, up. in a way that works, right. It's yeah. like, you, maybe we don't have to stop eating meat. You can still go to in and out burger and save the planet. If we just have to start being smarter about how exactly. we do things. Exactly. I mean, I'm eventually here, I'm, I'm, I'm just starting the initial analysis to incorporate grass fed beef as an option and a byproduct from this. Right. But from there too, there's a lot of other um, products that can come from it. Like I, uh, you were talking about the small farmers kind of getting, pushed out a little bit and you're 100% right. However, we're also in a really unique spot where they've been given so much power that through things like Instagram, like people value handmade, custom crafted, real true products so much better than a lot of this like plastic junk that lasts three months and then you just throw it right into the landfill, right? You know, the old school stuff that we used to get and you know, we can say it all day long, they just don't make it like they used to, but it's like, it's real. like. Remember the original flip phone? You could throw it against a wall and it was going right. to live. Those Motorola now, flip phones. Now you <laughs> sneeze wrong and your screen cracks, you know? Right. Right. <laughs> but uh, like there, there's there's some real opportunities for people to start innovating in that in that kind of a level. Um, and you're starting to see it in a place like Umpqua Valley where you've got a, some really talented craftsmen like starting to kind of like break through with some of this stuff. And it's just, you know, pulling them all back together. So for people so, that aren't woke and they're not from or Oregon and... You know, they've never been to Portlandia and, and a lot of people when they think of Oregon, they probably all they know is Portland. They probably like, they're like, oh, it's not where there's a bunch of crazy hippies protesting all the time. And Portland is kind of its own universe within Oregon. And then yeah. and then you have you got the coast where I'm from and you got the southern Oregon region, which is a real mix, kind of that redneck hippie vibe. You definitely got your yeah. like super yeah. right wing, you know, like holdouts. And then you got your super hippies, the Ashland dreadlock, you know, and and then you kind of got your in between, which kind of I kind of feel like you're kind of one of these guys like kind of like you know I, I lived in big surf for a long time too and all the pot growers are you know trucker hat wearing you know carhartt wearing like hunting and fishing but they would like sacrifice their life to save a redwood tree you know like right. they, they really defy all the stereotypes right and 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 they're intelligent you know and yeah and there's got to be an, an intelligent way to solve these big problems we have without it always being like you can't do this and we're constantly being made to feel guilty about our lifestyle choices. You know, it's like mm -hmm. cart, you know, even like, uh, you know, uh, bitcoins, you know, it takes energy to create cryptocurrency. Right, so that's one right. of the big criticisms of cryptocurrency, but it's like, yeah, but it's trying to solve this other bigger. It's like, there's no perfect way to do this, but we've got to start doing something. And it's mm -hmm. like, people love to smoke and hemp has the potential to be such a productive crop for us to produce domestically and mm. if we can kind of lead we just need to like brand it and market it well and that's why i think like defining these regions to be like no, no you don't want to just smoke hemp you want to smoke umqua valley hemp right because yeah. it's really you should special. push that all day long i would appreciate that <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying man I, I i push emerald triangle cannabis a lot because i source yeah. all of our cannabis for our cannabis products from the emerald triangle because if you yeah. find the five percent of farms up there that are growing the outdoor flower that's just mind blowing uh -huh. I, I live in socal and everybody's like indoor og down here yeah and like people have like never seen a living plant and like i'll bring them some like outdoor and i'll trim it up a little tight you know uh -huh. and i'll, I'll show and they'll be like oh my god this is amazing this is the best indoor i've ever seen 
<laughs> oh. Uh oh. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Oh, nope. Now I lost you. Nope, you're gone. Just a little red. There, you go. there it is. There it is. I think my girlfriend tried to get on her Bluetooth headphones and that whoops. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. But no, you have a point. So it's like uh, one of my favorite inspirations uh, that come from the architecture world, uh, Bjark Ingels, uh, his motto, and it's funny, you know, architects, once they get to a certain part, uh, point in their careers, it, it's, it's important to release a book of your projects, right? So that's, you know, basically a public portfolio for people to look at. Well, uh, in architecture, there's a series of like uh, these sayings, like less is more, um less is a bore like all these different things well he came out with one called yes is more and it's like you were saying it's like we shouldn't have to sacrifice our lifestyle but we shouldn't sacrifice the important things we need to do and it's like a basis in a lot of his designs like all right we got to be carbon neutral but how do we make it fun like for right. one example one of his projects is like a big incinerator but they turn the top into a ski slope you know, because you're producing this extra energy. So like, let's make it fun, dude. Like, like, and I just love that concept. And it's something we're trying to really embody at the farm. It's like the, it, the vibes thing, you know, it's like, all right, so we get to play in the dirt all day. We get to wear board shorts and sandals. So let's like make it fun and like fix these things, but then produce like really rad stuff too. And I, I'm pretty hopeful about the hemp market now too, with like Safe Banking Act going through and like, because Kentucky's so behind it, like, we, we went through a crash in 2019 because so many people flocked to it, right? But now that all of a sudden incentivized uh, people to start looking at these other avenues that hemp can do from the fiber standpoint. So it's like, it should be a massively big time construction material because of its renewable speed. You know, once, once people start committing to that and they go through the engineering like uh, processes to like certify some of this stuff like in forms of blue lambs and uh the hemp creates a big deal like um and that starts bleeding into actual construction projects and all that stuff like that's going to be a big deal so it's like uh your acreages are going to be going more towards that like like smaller 12 20 acre farms like wineries will be your boutique flower and stuff which is the route we really want to kind of go towards um but then those people that learned how to grow it uh, at scale, we'll be able to start producing the fiber to really build some stuff while still bullying in that carbon sink that you're talking about. So once we get there, like that, that'll be a game changer. I know there's people like building surfboards and skateboards out of it. I think it, it works really well as like a finished material that's non-structural bearing. Um, lots of lots of unique things going around out there right now, but it just it really needs like one of these big mill guys or something to finally commit to it. But uh, they're not quite ready. And with lumber, the price of where it is, they're probably doing pretty well. So right. incentive isn't quite there, but right. it'll, it'll of, be there. It'll, come. it'll be, it'll be there. It'll come. And I, I know like, yeah, it's like, we've been talking about hemp and hemp create, I feel like forever, you know, and it's mm -hmm. like, just, it's like, why aren't, why aren't, you know, and I know in Europe, they use a lot more of the hemp plastics. Um, the United States is kind of behind, but I think we're going to catch up in a hurry because yeah, 3d printing will change that too. Yep. When you, when you can print when you can print concrete or plastic and it's naturally produced, that's going to be a big deal. Yep. Especially yep. with oil going sky high yep. over time, because the more expensive that gets, the more incentive it is to find a cheap alternative. That, I think what's what really excites me about what's happening, especially with hemp, more so than cannabis, because cannabis is I don't know what the split is. It's probably 50 50 sun ground versus indoor. Um, something like that at least in california and but hemp is almost 100 percent outdoor and there's there's like a, i've seen a little bit of indoor hemp but it's almost kind of silly to grow it in mm -hmm. i think i've seen like the white or whatever that cbd cbg strain yeah yep. because it's got a cool look to it and, but but hemp is really i think mostly going to be a sun ground crop it's yeah. just more productive that way it just doesn't yeah. make sense um, you can make it to the level of the indoor and it's just like for the margins and the yields, it's like, it's, it's kind of pointless to use anything, but it's kind sun. of pointless. And I, I think cannabis would do the same thing. And and I think there are not to like go down a total rabbit hole here, but I think there are some cultivars of cannabis that do better indoors, you know, like for four, I went and bought yes. some indoor OG because OG Kush 
does really well in a nice fucking indoor grow room, you know, but yeah. for ni- 98% of cultivars, I'd really rather smoke sun grown. There's just a couple yeah. of those like really finicky Kush varietals that I liked in indoor. There, there are some, and that's where like the unique thing about like the uh, Umqua Valley that you're talking about is you do have to be pretty per- per- particular about the genetics you use uh, just because of the length of our growing season. Like, you know, in SoCal, you can, you can get away with a little bit more because you're going to have more sun and everything like that. But in Oregon, you know, come September, you can be getting rains and stuff like that already. And if, if you've got a genetic that's not going to finish until mid-October or even late October, like you've got to be either A, it's got to be really resistant to mold and mildew and all that stuff. Or B, you have to be very conscious of the way you've cultivated that situation right. so that you're helping it, you know, yield past that as well. So there, they, around here, you can get caught, you know, you know, For we've sure. seen it a few years in a row. So I know I believe it. And that, that's what makes the outdoor cultivation so special and, and using the native soil, um, mm-hmm. you know, using, using, nat- it's like, you know, there's a lot of grows like out here in California in the desert, like the Coachella Valley grows a lot mm-hmm. of in, indoor flower and some of it's really good. But it's like it's 120. It's it's Saudi Arabia out there mm-hmm. in the summer, mm-hmm. and they're having to blast so much air conditioning to keep those mm-hmm. grow rooms cool. It just doesn't make any sense. The mm-hmm. the cost just doesn't make sense. And I, I think mm-hmm. eventually cannabis will shift more to sun grown once and, and like light depth greenhouse, mixed light greenhouse. And I think that shift will come when it goes federal, mm-hmm. because once it goes federal, and if they give uh, licenses out to allow people to start growing at acreage, like the folks right. that have figured out the acreage side, you just, you can't compete, you can't compete. at that scale. Like, in, and if you have the quality, which is the hardest part to do it, because when you scale like the very end from, uh, harvest to dry, to cure, to storage, like it's so easy to mess that up unless you know exactly what you're doing. And if right. you mess that up, you go from great stuff to horrible stuff like overnight. And so if, if a, if a group knows how to do all that, it's like, it's, it's pretty rough to compete. For sure. I mean, thing. isn't that when the tobacco industry, I mean, they are kind of good at that, right? They know how to, I know cannabis requires and hemp, you know, I think the hemp cigarette mm-hmm. is going to be like, it's kind of like pre-rolls. Like when, when California legalized in 2018, if you had asked me in 2017, Hey, what product is going to like vanish? I would have said pre-rolls, like pre-rolls mm-hmm. are just going to be gone. I totally missed that because pre-rolls are huge, at least in California. I would enjoy- I would agree. I totally messed up on that one too. Because I just like, thought, well, people just buy the weed and roll their own yeah. joint because I roll my own joints, but they're convenient. You know, there's a reason why yeah. cigarettes are so popular because it's convenient. And, and I just, and I realized that too, I, I can't remember a while because I was like a little bit of an, in a tunnel, like building that out, like growing 80 acres was not an easy thing. So it's like, I had no life there for a while. And uh, once I was getting back out and kind of like really you know, getting to know a couple different communities and see what their reactions was. I saw the same thing. It's like, oh my gosh, these pre-rolls, like people really, really love them. And then I started smoking them and then I was like, okay, all right, I'm now my own target market. That's mm-hmm. great. So like one of our clients has some really great pre-rolls too. And it's like, I, there's definitely a, a future and, there, but it has to be quality. Yeah. If you're just using trim or anything like that, like, dude, get that out of here. Well, that's, that's what's, that's what's cool is, yeah, it's all flour, no trim, the good ones. Yeah. And they're infusing them now with rosin and keef yep. and all this stuff. And yep. Yep. I think we'll see the same thing on the hemp side. I'm really interested in the extraction capabilities of hemp because I have a rosin press or rosin tech here at home. And I press a lot of my own rosin and I've been pressing hemp. I've been pressing your hemp flour, but like maybe my press is too little or, you know, the, the hemp yeah. like doesn't squish as good, but I think yeah. if you could take, if you could do the live rosin approach, I'd love to see somebody do it and just to understand how possible yeah. is this to take fresh frozen hemp, yeah. make ice water hash, freeze dry it and squash it. Cause that's how they're mm-hmm. making all the really good live rosin yeah. with cannabis. Can we People do keep that? Talking about it. Yeah. But I just haven't seen anyone do it just because I think what happened there was 2019 flooded the market. And so there's like, there's so much oil in the background that you know the boutique they don't see the value in it just because you can right. buy you know a liter for well, like nothing the, anymore exactly and everybody's turning into cbd isolate and, and liters of distillate and dis- distillate the thing about distillation is you know I, I try not to shame any product or extraction type i think they all have their place and i think distillate mm-hmm. Distillate is scalable, right? It helps scale brands. Mm-hmm. It helps scale product lines. You know, mm-hmm. I don't use it in my products because I like the real whole plant, but mm-hmm. um, I, I get distillate. It's, it's cool. You know, you can, you know, you're, you're just extracting the cannabinoids, but with hemp, 
most of it's gone you know, into distillation, most of it's CO2, because that's where most of the bulk extractors are using CO2, which is a really good extraction method. You know, it comes from the fossil fuel industry, but the, the solventless stuff, it's just starting to really pick back up in California. Like the legalization mm -hmm. kind of derailed everybody mm -hmm. because like, you know, I just bought a gram of live rosin, you know, it's like 80 bucks, you know, for a gram mm -hmm. of live rosin. That's really expensive when you can get some shatter, BHO shatter for 25 bucks a gram. Mm -hmm. but the market's starting to differentiate and there's people that just want Budweiser. And then there's people that want, you know, the micro brew, yeah, you know, the exactly. small batch. And, and I think hemp's going to yeah. follow that too. It's just going to take uh, a little while. That's exactly the analogy I use. Like, I mean, I compared the Valley to the wine, but when I got into this, you know, it was at the very beginning of the micro brewing, like really blow up kind of phase. And, you know, I, I thought I was going to grow hops and start brewing beer and all that stuff until I found this, but like, definitely trying to form ourselves like a microbrewery it's like and, and have hemp, our, our boutique cultivars and our unique you know style and all that and our and vibe products and, i mean a, a good hemp yeah. cigarette that comes in a nice pack that looks like cigarettes not the cones because mm -hmm. um, the cones are like an occasion but mm -hmm. if you just want to strike you know like mm -hmm. a, like a like a whatever cigarettes are you know they're like 0.75 grams or i can't remember what a, what a tobacco cigarette is but they got it down like yeah they got the yeah. technology down to how to roll a really good tobacco cigarette if we can get the right machinery to roll the perfect hemp joint and mm -hmm. like and find the right percentage maybe it's not a 15 percent cbd strain for that maybe it's a four percent cbd strain with a mm -hmm. nice with a nice you know subtle terpene yeah. profile that actually is the best you know, we're, we're going to yeah. see it. Mar Marble will have a hemp cigarette yeah. in the next yeah, 10 years. We, got a, we made a, we made some friends with a new genetic group this year that we're going to try out that it's kind of like that. It's like, it's a super high terpene profile, like set of strains. Uh, but their actual CBD content is a lot lower. Like the benefit of that is that you're getting all that flavor, but you're still coming in at completely compliant as a trimmed flower. Completely compliant. Pretty hard to do. And so, CBD is a muscle relaxer. So yeah. A little bit is great, but you know, for, for me, at least if I smoke four or five hemp joints, I do get a little bit sleepy. Chill. You yeah. Know? You chill out. Yeah. So if it was like, <laughs> if it was like 4%, then I could smoke five or six of them in a day, yeah. which is most like smokers are probably going to smoke five or six cigarettes in a day. So if you're trying to like, I just see the hemp cigarette as literally like the healthy cigarette. Like if we can yeah. get yeah. people off of, off of tobacco and smoking mm -hmm. hemp, it's way better mm -hmm. for you. I agree. Uh, there's all these medicinal benefits. It's clean. You mm -hmm. know, if, if we can like, that's why, that's why I really wanted to talk to you, Ron, because I think, I think what you're doing and, and what people like you are doing in the hemp space is like the Trojan horse, because we can get, we can like change multiple industries because of the utility of hemp. Hemp is going to be a recreational product. You know, there's going to be cigarettes, beverages, edibles, there already is, but there's going to be mm -hmm. all these, you know, quote unquote recreational products, but then there's the industrial side, the hemp create, you know, it's like, yep. And if we approach it from this kind of holistic way, because we're the leaders, like no, nobody's an expert on regenerative hemp farming more than you, you know, or people like you that are actually doing it. Like gov politicians aren't the experts on it. Definitely you know, not. Uh, <laughs> Fortune 500 company CEOs aren't the experts on it. Like you are, like we are, this community is the experts on it. So we, we actually have the bully pulpit right now to say, hey, this is how you do it. You know, you don't do it like this. We actually, you do it like this, you know, you do it in a, in a regenerative manner. You do it, you do it in a way that is fun and exciting. And, and you know, it's Tesla, you know, it's not mm -hmm, Prius, right? it's Tesla. Like we're going to yeah. make this fun and sexy and styly and cool because we're good. We're good capitalists and good marketers, but we also care about people and the environment and the crop that we produce and like restoring some craftsmanship and integrity yeah. into the economy right because i think i think that's what's going on man like I, I think people are really disenfranchised right now and disconnected from their work like this mm -hmm. is total marxism this is my u of o education coming into play yeah. but you know i don't agree with a lot of Karl marx but there's a lot of it that does resonate with me and the one thing is that what capitalism does it removes the person from the craft and there's very few crafts left in this country. I mean, I can count on one hand the amount of crafts. Being a small farmer is one of them. Being a chef, where you actually are creating something and you get to give it to, you get to see the person actually use your product. There's very few crafts left in America. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of it, all our manufacturing has been exported. I think people feel really disconnected from the fruits of their labor. You know, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think the hemp and the cannabis industry is... The, the rebuttal to that. And people are going, you know, no, I, I want to, I'm going to build a brand out of my garage. I'm going to have a garage band brand and I'm going to scale it up. 
it's like the it, like i was saying this is kind of like the last stand of the american dream like we well, can wrestle back the american dream I, with this industry i think i'm a bit more optimistic about it too um i think it's already happening because like i see this really cool spark at least in my area and as when i do get the chance to travel out a little bit more i see people resonate with it really well they haven't connected to it but they resonate really well but it's like uh, one of my buddies is a blacksmith right now, making custom blacksmith pieces for people. Uh, another one is crafting really nice uh, jewelry out of gemstones around here. Uh, I got one that welds like this really cool decorative piece. Like there is this stuff that's starting to spawn up and slowly kind of go through these new digital channels because in, in society now, we can all of a sudden make that in Umpqua, Oregon and ship it to New York City. And like, we've never had that kind of a supply chain before. And like, even with COVID and what it's going to be doing to the shipping and all that stuff, logistics, we, we need to figure out how to do it better in cardboard and all that. And like, I, I have my own hard time, like, you know, shipping shipments of too much plastic and too much cardboard is something that's on our list to fix this year. Um, but like, it, it's a very unique time period where you can feed yourself and do something like that. And people are all of a sudden looking for that kind of a thing. And so it's like, if you can put this story out there, like, well, this is at least the mindset to go about like approaching it, whatever it is that means something to you. Like, you know, you've got maybe those computer coders start composing, you know, uh, plenty of them are doing stuff like that are pretty rad and stuff behind the scenes for that. Well, yeah, push that, you know, your musicians push that um uh like nfts are like going to change that entire system like who knows with cryptocurrencies i'm way behind on all that but like that that'll open up some new floodgates um oh what else am i missing but uh in, in, anything that you're passionate about they can go and start working on that um man i, I so that's where i'm kind of coming from a little yeah. bit more optimistic side it's no, like I, I feel you encouragement and uh and with that uh uh, I guess that, you know, your stimulus stuff will probably kind of start to fizzle out here, but we'll see. But it's like, as long as they can feed themselves and house themselves, that'll be the hardest part. It's making sure affordable places to live to support that kind of mindset. But yeah, um, yeah we, we, we've got some macro problems as a planet yeah. to deal with. For sure. <laughs> I, I don't know how to solve those. But <laughs> I'm just a farmer. I draw pictures for a living. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm inspired by the craft movement and you know, I hope it's not just like a teaser. And that it really yeah, is right. Real. And I, I think, you know, maybe the, you know, maybe the millennials and the, and the Gen Zers really will like reclaim. We're going to have to have some fundamental shifts though. Like, yeah, that's why I like the crypto thing. And I don't get, it. I'm an idiot on cryptocurrency. I have no idea. NFT. I just learned about like two weeks ago, you know, I have no right, idea. Right. Right. But it seems really cool. Like it seems paradigm shifting, you know? Yeah. And like, yeah. that's what we need. We need, we need to like up in the current model. It's not working. Yeah. Like, it's working really well for the one percent of the one percent they've they've extracted most of the wealth and and you're right they're like you said something earlier about what's like you know people go out they don't see the real cost of things right it's like yeah maybe you know what's the cost of doing something one way to the environment and to the air quality that we breathe because you know, this is one of the things that always trips me out about oil companies it's like they go out and just harvest this oil from the earth for free Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, they have to pay for the equipment and they have to buy the land, but I mean, they don't actually pay for the oil itself. Like you just buy those mineral rights and like, you can, you can drill it, but there's a cost to that, you know, like obviously like putting out all this carbon into the atmosphere, there's a mm -hmm. cost to everybody. Mm -hmm. And like, that's just not even on, on people's radar right now. Mm -hmm. And I think, I know there's like green economy movements and a way to like actually see the real environmental cost of things. Mm -hmm. But I think right now, like that's like big legislative bureaucratic juggernaut, slow moving shit. Mm -hmm. I think where we can accelerate this as entrepreneurs is by doing things the right way and then telling a great story, marketing it really well branding it really well and and being the teslas you know being being the company that just says i'm going to go against the entire way that things are being done right now with this other way that's way smarter i just mm -hmm. we just got to build the consensus to get to it correct um, and i think i think it's i think i mean I, I have my good days and bad days about it. the environment is a tough one for me to stay too optimistic about just because i'm yeah. a bleeding heart liberal and like i just yeah. i feel the pain of mother earth yeah and but I know that people are out. I, I believe in humanity though, too. Like I really mm -hmm. do. Like, I think, I think our best shot is to innovate our well, our way out of the ecological challenges that we have. 
Mm-hmm. And if we can do that, like once you start building the momentum, people will shift over. You just got to like build yeah. the initial momentum and you got yeah, to show just, that there's a better way to do it. That's fun gotta, and exciting. People have to believe in it and want it. And so if that happens, then, you know, it'll, it'll come, it'll, it'll come to place. And it's like, and with the ecology thing, there, there's a really great documentary. They just, they just uh, released, released recently called uh, kiss the ground. I uh, highly recommend watching that because it really does kind of show it's like, you know, this is easily solvable. Like there's one really quick uh, clip in the middle that kind of like isolates that. It's like in June, it, they, they, I think it was an infrared view they had basically on the globe, right? And it shows like carbon like being released in the air, right? And I want to say it's like in June, May, June, somewhere around there, they show this massive like huge chunk of carbon just like boom going up into the air because that's the time that we till the earth right so the soil is one of our best carbon captures right because we're actually using it as minerals through there to grow vegetation right so it shows all this stuff being launched up into the air and so then on the flip side you know in uh when is it september or, or whatever the dates are that all those crops are coming to fruition it shows a massive reverse of it because all of a sudden you see all these crops like re pulling it in so just like one simple move of being able to convert that to no-till by itself, I mean, the magnitude of a no-till globe is ridiculous. Right. And so there's simple solutions to it all. And like now that people are paying attention more to fungi and bacteria and the beneficial ways of cultivating that in the right way, it's like that adds another tool to that belt. So it's like you put that system together and... I can't remember the math, but they're like, you could flip it around five years if there was like actual consent, global consent. That's just the hardest part. So it's there. It yeah, just it matters like, doing it. The no-till thing is really caught on. I know like, you know, the Emerald Triangle again, it's like as soon as a couple of farms start doing something and they learn a better way to do it, everybody follows suit. And it's like exactly five years ago, people were kind of talking about no-till, but yeah. like, you don't want to sacrifice your harvest. You're like, I don't know, yeah. I'm doing it this way and it's working. It's, it's, it is I don't terrifying. know if I want to it's try hard. something different. It's like um, with us, like if, if you look into hemp cultivation, uh, uh, the majority of people use a uh, plastic mulch in their rows, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I didn't have the heart to do that because all I could see was like 50% of my acreage is covered in plastic that I then throw away every year. And like, there's some biodegradable ones out there. I just question you know wh- how well that is actually good for the soil and all this stuff but um just removing that it was you know kind of terrifying because it's like then all of a sudden you're battling weeds so that's a whole different cost a whole different set of equipment you need to design and make work um and then yeah the potential of like they're taking the those i don't like the word weeds because it's too negative but those additional plants that are then growing are absorbing a bunch of your nutrients as well and so it is like it can drastically like reduce uh yields and so like a lot of our early yields were not as big as they could have if i would use plastic mulch Mm -hmm. but it's like i just i couldn't do it but then i've started to see more and more people are starting to navigate away from that concept as they're seeing it's like no, no no actually we can do it right so now we plant a cover crop underneath that we just mow so we're still adding more uh um night nutrients back into the soil continually but it's also shading that whole lower ground too well, so. sometimes simpler is better right i mean that's what i love about the no-till thing and i started no-till farming probably about six years ago and and this is like i still I, i'm a cultivator still but mostly more of a product manufacturer these days but i started no-tilling just because i heard people talking about it i read I read, you know, teaming with microbes, you know, and yeah, I was hip to all of that. And I understand, and I was like, well, this is great because now I don't have to till, like, it's just less manpower, you know? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. if like, I'm always a big fan of whatever's better, faster and smarter. And if you can develop a system that requires less labor, that's better for the environment, produces a better quality product and it's cheaper and faster. Like that's where, like, that's where I am hopeful about it because that's what the earth does, right? Like the earth, the earth doesn't really waste energy. Like it's a very evolved spaceship that we're on planet earth hurtling around the universe. And it's really good at recreating life. It does it incredibly fast. Look at like the Hawaiian islands, you know, the newest land mass on earth. It's like plants start growing like almost in no time. Like we're, the earth is incredibly good at being efficient and humans are really good at being really inefficient because we have these monkey minds that are always tripping us up 
but if we can if we can look to nature learn from nature i really think we got a really good shot because it can it can be in alignment with fun and sexy and beautiful and efficient and and there can be economic growth Mm -hmm. there can be all Mm -hmm. the things that people want like nobody argues Mm -hmm. with this stuff like i could go to the most conservative republican the most liberal democrat somebody from it doesn't matter where you're from if i say hey I know a way to do it that is going to produce a better product. It's going to be cheaper for you to make it. And it's better for the environment. No one's going to say no to that. Yeah, you know? that's impossible. It's impo- so yes. that, that's what we need to find. And as long as we can continue to move things in that direction, I think, I think we've got a pretty good shot. And, and maybe I'm crazy, but I really think hemp is what is going to save the planet. Like, I, I literally believe that. What, what I, my, my favorite thing to say about that, too, is just kind of like, pigeons us in the corner that we're always dealing with is like, I think, I think hemp is the gateway drug to that revolution. Yeah. <laughs> Cause yeah. it's like, there's so many other beneficial plants that you can actually start doing so many more cool things with, but because hemp is going to start getting back into that position, we're all of a sudden looking more at it. So it's like, like fungi, for example, it's like people are starting to look at all the different mushrooms you can grow and all their beneficial things, like down to like decomposing plastic, you know? And it's like, now we're open-minded to it because we've already gone through a wave of hemp and we're like, Oh yeah, there's this, you know, like British Columbia, there's doing some incredible research up there on like mycelium networks and, and, and oh yeah, that's, that's a whole different rabbit hole. That's exciting. So it is. Yeah. The Pacific Northwest, my, my sister lives in British Columbia. She lives in Tofino, which is a really mm-hmm. super cool town. And everyone, like whenever I go up to visit her in Tofino, I feel like I'm in some like eco utopia, right you know everyone is like so environment like there's sign there's like multiple recycling you know for everything you could possibly imagine and like water conservation is a really big deal even though they have tons of water up there they're just really mindful about yeah you know everything and and like it's kind of like hawaii too like when you grow up in hawaii like you learn about the plants Mm -hmm. um almost more than you learn about other subjects Mm -hmm. um and it's kind of that way in british columbia and to a certain extent northern california and the pacific northwest but i really noticed it up in canada where it's like people really know about the native american history or the first nations as they call them up there and they know about the plants they they know about the bears and they know about the salmon and like they're they're more in tune with their environment down here in asphalt land in southern california you know it's really easy other than like going to the beaches to get really disconnected from the natural world like i just love seeing the like that painting behind you of the trees and just connects me to my oh, yeah. my oregon roots you know it's um, forest land man forest yep that looks like the <laughs> oregon coast to me it's like <laughs> that looks like cape foul weather or something right where i grew up yeah yeah but i just love it man it's really it's really good to talk to you ron um i i you know you're obviously a really smart guy and, and your background in architecture and 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 your passion for doing things this way is like really exciting um I really respect what you're doing. And at the end of the day, just the quality of what you're producing, like all the ways that you get there is super cool. And the regenerative approach, I think is so important. Um, but I just want people to try your stuff and to try this hemp flower that's out there. Cause I know a lot of people, a lot of people that I sell my products to topicals and tinctures primarily, they're usually the non-smoker types. Um, but I really want people to just try it, you know, like there, yeah. there's a lot yeah. more people that aren't into cannabis that actually that, that are, I mean, in other words, we have like 50 million people in this country that probably never smoked or aren't going to be smoking blunts, you know, yeah. but they might try a little bit of hemp flour just because I want people to, to understand how cool it is and like, and how grounding it can be, you know, and like my endocannabinoid system is pretty fired up. So, but like for somebody <laughs> that doesn't smoke a lot, like smoking a little bit of hemp flour could be all you need to just be like oh my god like my anxiety levels are diminished i can sleep better at night yeah um, it could be a ma- major benefit to people's lives that you know it's it's not snake it's, oil it's it's, it's, it's a the great, real deal it's a great morning coffee ritual for me like pre-meditation uh go walk through like our starts at the greenhouse and just kind of like ground yourself in the morning uh super rad there afternoon break and then you know evening chill out and then if I, we spend a lot of time out in nature. So like hiking and all that stuff. And yeah, you're, uh, you're a big it's hunter. great on all those. Yeah. So <laughs> you're a hunter and a fisherman too, right? Well, I wouldn't say I am. I was just like, uh, I just got started on this fly fishing because it just, it, it looks so rad and magical. And then once you go out once, it's like, it is so rad and magical. It's like, I don't even care if I ever catch a fish. It's just like, I just love existing out there and like, being a part of that whole system and then 
Um, I'm, I do a lot of like freestyle. Like I wouldn't call it rock climbing because it's not like I'm going up like a cliff or anything, but just like some of the lower grade things that you'd find out off the trail in the wilderness, just kind of climbing up some peaks and stuff. That's fun. Um, and then I like, I, I got one of those one wheels that I like, you know, blasting around on trails. That's pretty nice, rad. Nice, nice, so nice. I don't know. I just, I, I'm a master of nothing and I'm curious about everything. So it's like, I gotta, you know, gotta try everything twice. Thanks for joining me today on Head Change, the podcast that puts you in a better headspace. I've been your host, Levi Strong. You can find full transcripts of today's episode on our blog at www.awakenederyday.com.